2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be intimate with unbelievers. That's the context here. You hear what I'm saying? For what fellowship, and that word fellowship is koinonia, hath righteousness with unrighteousness. And what communion or relationship hath light with darkness? The word communion is, is, is fellowship, it's association, it's, it's community, it's, it's, it's joint participation, partnership, intimacy. We are not to be intimate with unbelievers. We are to be intimate with God. When you have that desire innermost that you try to fill with human relationship, you'll come up short. There's a place only God can fill. Only God can fill. And, and, and sometimes even the greatest saints struggle with God because of maybe they go through a hurt or a loss and they want to fill it with other things. That's for God to fill. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 19 through 21, then we'll pray and let you be seated. 2 Corinthians, just one chapter back, three verses. Say amen if you're there. Amen. To wit or to know that God was in Christ, reconciling. That's bringing back together. That's, that's bringing a broken relationship back together. That's what Easter is. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the church. That's the disciples. This is our calling. It's not about accumulating, gathering documents on the wall of achievements or filling houses and closets and garages with stuff. The greatest, the greatest accumulation. Look around you. How many souls have you reconciled or helped become an ambassador to bring people? That's a calling. That's why you get anointed. Now then you are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. If you're not close to God, he didn't move. If you're not intimate with God, he's not the one that left. He didn't pack up and leave the apartment, Brother Lawrence. He didn't. He's right there. The Bible says he's as close as the mention of his name. If you're not feeling him, if you're struggling speaking in tongues, God didn't move. He's right there. I don't know how many times in dealing and working with people and trying to bring that relationship together. It's one party that there was there all the time. The other one just was looking to fill void with other things. You want, to, you want to meet your spouse, look for them at an altar. Because if they're not going to be close with God, don't expect them to be close with you. If they're not going to be passionate with God, don't look for passion with them. And passion isn't that, that, that emotional heat of a moment that I'm not, no, no, no. Passion is staying with them when everything's ugly. When the bills ain't being paid and the car don't start and you wake up and your hands aren't young and strong anymore. Or That's passion. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's place our Bibles down. Let's go to the Lord of prayer. Lord, we love you. We need you. Lord, we say we need you, but help us get a revelation of how deeply and how importantly we need you. Anoint this place with your presence. Allow me to move in the unction of your spirit, your Holy Ghost, Lord. And we walk and tread softly, gently, Lord, with your people, God. As I try to 
convey one of the most important things in our relationship with you, an intimate relationship, a close relationship with you. Lord, as we talk about that uninhibited relationship or communion with you, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Easter is about reconciliation. It's about restoring a broken relationship. Understand, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. And we know God was in Christ, so we're not talking about the second person in the Trinity. God robed himself in flesh. The reason the word Son is used is because the flesh was still born of woman. Don't get confused there. Made of a woman, made under the law to redeem that redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. There's a word in the Bible, I didn't think about it until right now, the word bastards in the Bible, that's fatherless. When you're lost, when you're, when you're, when you're not in Christ, you're fatherless. It's important in the plan of salvation to understand that we need our heavenly father and he's made a way of escape for each and every one of us. More important than anything you achieve, that you accomplish, accumulate, the most important thing you have is an uninhibited relationship pillar in your home, in your life. Of all the pillars that you could have, you've got to have an uninhibited relationship with Jesus. How many knows what it's like to walk into the presence of the Lord with blatant sin in your life. I don't want you to raise your hands. How many of us know what it's like? You're done messed up and you come walking into church and you just feel like, anybody? Jesus came for even that. You see, the plan of salvation changes heaven's courtroom from a criminal trial to an adoption ceremony. <laughs> I'm thankful. I'm thankful that, uh, and, and it's this is important to me because there was a time when I was familyless, when I was, you know, I had what you call biological relations, but they wanted nothing to do with me. And I, and, and I didn't fault them for it. the lifestyle I was living, the, the recklessness that I was living, the dangerous that I was living. It wasn't safe to have me around. But my mother wasn't even home, and there was a drive-by done at her house because I was there. So it got ugly, and I needed a relationship with Jesus Christ, or I was just going to become another statistic in a gutter. Psalms 24 and 1, uh, uh, it goes on to say this. Just You can turn there or you can follow. The earth is the Lord's. Listen as you accumulate things of the earth. Uh, you may put your name on it, but you ain't taking it with you. You can get accolades and slaps on the back and some kind of subculture relationship, you know. But listen, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? Who can stand in his holy place? Please think about that. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. It is, it is the will of God that you have a personal connection and relationship, an ongoing relationship with the Lord, an intimate communion. And I know we use communion and we, we celebrate communion at watch night and other various times throughout the year. But that word communion literally means an understanding of the relationship, the cost. Young people seek the right relationship. 
Because if you do it right, it costs. It's a good cost. Because when you love, it's not 50-50. 50-50, we'll be in my, you'll be in my office. Or the courtroom. It's 100 and 100. It's, it's, it's literally purposely seeking to do what the other one is pleased by. And the married folks said, yeah, man, yes, it is. Mm-hmm. We can understand, and it's clearly seen in the book of Genesis, that the Lord had a creative order to protect that relationship that he desired. And when God formed man from the dust of the earth, he instituted a close communion or relationship with him from the very beginning. Genesis 3 and 8 says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This gives us a picture that was a daily practice of the Lord walking with Adam and Eve. God's desire would come to this, this place, this garden that he planted and spent time with Adam and Eve. That, that's, that's God's desire is to spend time with you. I, I, I think it, it's one of the most um, awkward feelings when you're sitting next to something and you have nothing to say. Anybody ever been on a date? You're like, oh, this ain't working. Ooh, let's don't order the dessert. Let's get out of here. Check, yeah, checklist. And so when, when, when we read Genesis, we can almost sense the heartbreak in God's voice when he is forced to confront the sin. Because God knows that that sin is going to create a barrier in this communion, this, this relationship. It's going to create a barrier with the partnership and the relationship that he loves. And we must understand that for a holy God, anything unholy poses a problem and places a barrier for the intimacy he longs to have with us. I tell you what, you, you, you take two married people and someone uh, does the unthinkable. Though they may stay together, there is a barrier. There is a problem created. I hope none of you feel that. I hope none of you ever go through that. But it is, it is a type and shadow of when you betray your relationship with God. And to that, understanding the work of Calvary, which we celebrate this week, has provided the initial solution to this barrier, this dilemma. Thank God for Easter. Thank God for the resurrection. We understand that the crucifixion was the brutal price to pay to restore our communion, our relationship. We have, you understand, we're, we're jumping and shouting about it because we're thankful. But don't forget, he bled for it. Don't be so quick to just sweep it under the rug. Thank you, Je No, thank you, Jesus. That, that, that's why even on a Wednesday night, he still was standing up and lifting up my arms for him. He still said, yeah, 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 I, no matter how tired. I, I do all this stuff all week long. I, I play with my toys. I work with my job. I go here. I, I stay up late to do that. How dare, I'm not going to walk in here. Enough. And I understand what this costs for me to have this today. I never want to take it for granted. I were, you and I were separated from him. My sin and your sin, all sin, became an instrumental obstacle for you and I to ever get close to God. Now, I know we're not called to judgment of each other, but we are to be quite judgmental in our attitude towards sin. Did you hear me? I didn't mix it. You, you understand what I'm saying there? God help us hate sin like he does. No, 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 no. Not the sin you see in your brother, but the sin you see in yourself. And if you don't see sin, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Psalm 6, 6, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 
God spoke to Israel one day and gave this great verse that we shout it, we shout it over, and pretty much everybody's lived for God, and let's not shout about it. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. I've said it a million times if I've said it once. But it goes on to say, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. What's iniquity? You won't be governed. You won't be told what to do. You're not going to be dictated to. Right? Come on, teenagers. What a month. You're going to get them all mad at you, Matthew. Chill out. <laughs> let, pastor, let pastor speak it. <laughs> so the prophet makes it clear that our iniquities, our lawlessness, our... Now let me say this. Each and every one is, has separate things that God's dealt with us about. If Abraham never went up the mountain... He'd have been in disobedience. He'd have been full of iniquity, lawless. I don't know all the things. We, we understand the biblical things, but there are some, you didn't get here without personal. If I told Sister Crow I was going to do something, or she asked me to do something, I agreed, and I didn't do it, I'm straining the relationship. So you, you, you can't base what you're doing over just this. If you've ever been in a situation, how many has ever been, oh God, you get me out of this one? Well, you think God's dumb? He, he hurt you. Wait a minute. You were laying in a hospital bed. You weren't going to come out and you said, God, you get me out of this? I'll serve you with all my heart when I leave. And then you get out, well... I'm going to give like I ain't never gave. Well, hold on. I got a few things I like. Our iniquities are, are us. It has the power to drive a wedge between us and God. Not because God is, is vindictive. Not because he's spiteful. Not because he's hateful. God's not hateful. Not because he's angry, but because he is holy. Are you with me? He is so holy that iniquity, sin, dishonesty, transgressions are like a blockage in an artery that stops the flow of life-giving blood to the heart. And so that sin, that iniquity, that transgression blocks the communion, the relationship between God and us. If you've been in a relationship and something's happened and the person did something and you've kept it to yourself, but it's there. Come on, ladies. You know you'd be holding a grudge against us. Come on now. You're silent about it, but it's there. Hey, guys. Come on. I try to, I try to make, make. Come on, youngins. You know, man, you, man. I asked, I asked for an iPad. What do you mean I got a pair of shoes for my birthday? Come on, you got that little art in your heart now. You don't love me. <laughs> we have those unseen blockages. We do it with God, and so that's why this week, last week, and every week we celebrate the wonder of the cross. We talk about the cross of Calvary because that relationship with God's done everything possible to open the flow of relationship. How many knows that if it was God really that's kept the open door? It's God really that he's always there. He's always doing it. It's us. That's why we preach the wonder of the cross at Calvary because Jesus accomplished a miraculous work of redemption and reconciliation and and here here the, the the relationship was strained and he walked in going I bore it all for you he brought us back from the dominion of sin and he delivered us from the power of it how many is thankful to Jesus tonight yes. 
First John tells us if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, it's not just about confessing. It's about getting cleaned up. That means I'm not going to do it again. If you need good news today, the Bible has it for you. Colossians tells us in chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, buried with him in baptism, wherein he also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. He removed the blockage. Anybody thankful for that, that you've got access to God today, even though you've done something that should deny you? Because of the atonement, the covering, which was found in his blood, every born again, Jesus name believer, has been freed from the eternal consequences of sin. If that's old hat to you, maybe you haven't been honest with your walk with God, but I'm thankful today that I can go to a God that can redeem me and save me and forgive me and remove that blockage. created a way to a close, intimate communion. With him has been opened up to every one of us. You are as close to God as you want to be. In other words, we can walk again with the Lord in the cool of the day if you want to. If you want, am I the only one that, am I the only one, Brother Joe, is there, are you with, are you with me tonight? Sister Crow, are you with me tonight? I mean, my, my, I'm th- sis, my house echoes with the sound of prayer because of Sister Crow going on that walk with the Lord in the mornings. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I, that I know, hey man, there's other people thankful that he's opened up that. That, that blockage and allow us again to walk with him, to talk with him, to have a close, intimate relationship. Sin didn't win. Jesus let us back in. And so, if I would have this pillar in my spiritual house, then I have to be committed to keeping that relationship uninhibited. I've got to commune with the Lord every day. I have to have a firm commitment to keeping myself. Let me help you. I love you, and I got to preach because this is my calling and give you, but I got to keep myself free of anything which would put a blockage or a roadblock up in the path of my spiritual connection with him. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Me, You better have a prayer life. You better get in and know what's causing that blockage. Anybody have a time in your life when you're praying and it feel like the, you could, your, your prayers didn't go no higher than above your head? Oh, God, what's in my life? Search me and know me. I have to have that firm commitment to keeping myself Free of anything. Why? Because sin is offensive to him. I have to be committed to keeping sin out of my life. I'm just not going to run around with anybody. I'm just not going to buy into any anything. I'm just not going to. Uh, hold on. I, I, you may be okay doing that, but, but wait, wait. I, be, I better check. Now, when you, everybody, everybody ain't doing it. One of the prophets was all oh, crying and whining. Someone better hand him a tissue, crying and whining. Nobody lives for God like me. I got 7,000 over here. Everybody ain't doing it. It's not just sins that we commit, but 
What about the sins of omission as well? I, I've said this before. I said, the problem with some people is, is everybody knows what you're against. But they don't know what you're for for God because you're not doing anything for God. And showing up is still for you. <laughs> You'll get that one tomorrow. One of the more troubling verses or, or scriptures that we're confronted with, James 4 and 17. Let me help you if you just think showing up and your holiness and your righteousness is enough. Therefore, him that, that knoweth to do good. Is there, is there a word do in there? Did I add that? James 4, 17. Is that, is that a typo? So you got a lot of people sitting around. You don't do nothing wrong, but you're not doing anything right. You, you, you live for God so long that, you know, your dress code and your hair code and your shoe code and your, uh, yeah, th those are all things that, 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 that are you, but what are you doing for, 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 are you hearing what I'm saying? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him in his sin. Wait, what? Sin of omission. Many Christians are loud about what they're against, but those same folks are pretty silent on what they're for. Don't go gossiping about someone's issues when you haven't taught a Bible study in months or even years. I really don't care how long your sleeves are if you can't worship. Don't tell me how, how your holiness standards are so superior when you can't make it to prayer. Let's be honest. If you're for that, then be for it. I don't care how long you say you serve God if prayer time is no longer important to you. <laughs> Listen. Why am I saying that? Because I have to guard myself against the slins of my flesh. My mind. I have to guard myself against the sins of the spirit. When my spirit gets... Anybody ever had a bad spirit beside me? No? And how, you, like, you like being told you're wrong? Look, I don't. But I'm thankful when I'm told I'm wrong. <laughs> I have to guard myself against the sins of my mind. You got you you, you heard a gossip or you heard something. Maybe you didn't intend to hear you or you get you just and it messes with you and you you have an issue with someone you don't hardly know. Oh, God. Or maybe you're unforgiving. And, and you think you're justified because it was severe. And, and, and what you've done isn't it? Hasn't been? I have to guard against sins of the tongue. My mouth. I have to guard against the sins of my attitude. Because we all love hearing this, right? I think I said, I said again, it never works telling someone that needs to calm down that they need to calm down. Why? Because we have that nature in us. I, I, you know what? Let me tell you something. When you've been living for God as long as I have, the last thing I want is some whippersnapper saying you barely in, in, my, in, in, the, in the length of time come up and tell me I'm wrong. But that's my issue. Right? I mean, if I have a bad... And y'all and know I get upset. Thank you for accepting me like that. I got, Do I have to take you like that? Hello. Hello. If we ever... You know, the most dangerous place could be is the place where no one can correct you. And you're in a really bad place if you don't have a pastor that can correct you. And if you know he's speaking to your heart over the pulpit because he doesn't want to go directly to you, 
then take it from the pulpit so that it pretty soon there may be an altercation where I got to face you and your flesh and you don't make it. Work out your own salvation because, hey, my attitude, my spirit gets so oh God. I don't want anything to interfere with that communion with God, with that intimate relationship with him. You have to understand all this stuff matters. Look, if I put you on a deserted island, you're going to live for God fine. The problem is we start putting people on that island. And you have to understand that's what God is talking about. You have to be able to work with one another because that's how God sees who you really are. So that's why if, you're only, if you only ever do anything with your family and your household, you, you're stunted in your growth. That's why we have the church. That's why we have the body of Christ. Iron, sharp. Now you've got to improve. Because if we got to love the Lord thy God with all my mind, heart, soul, and strength, and the second is unlike it. What's the second? Your neighbor. How can you be fine coming back and forth to church and never reaching out to your neighbor? Because the fact that Jesus said, I'll never knew you was because you put a blockage in the relationship. What did he tell Peter? Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Three times. That was for us to realize, oh man, if we're going to be the people of God, we got to care about people. Somebody's glad the church cares about you. How many's glad that you, Brother Chuck, thank you for calling us. Thank you encouraged us when you called us about that healing. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for calling. Thank, when you call and tell me your burdens, when you call and tell me what you're going through, I'm thankful because I care. I want to know. Brother Joe, yeah, you call it some crazy times, but thank you. Thank you. Sister Crystal texts out, hey, I needed somebody's phone number today. Brother Christian, you must have had your phone. You drew it like a gun. Bam, he had it out there. I was like, okay. But I like that because we care. That's what the church is about. Listen, there's no big eyes and little use. It's just a great body of Christ. If you get a little attitude because you didn't get accolades, man, there's something wrong with you. Get that out of the way and let the church grow and flow. What is that doing? That's carefully and righteously protecting the relationship that I have with Jesus. If I got a strange one with you, how can it be good with God? He said, wait a minute, before you come to me, leave your gift at the altar and go fix it. That's right. Some of us have got something to fix for many years. I must, and I will ensure that my spiritual house has an unmovable pillar of uninhibited community. Stop it, stop it, wait a minute. That's important to me. How is it that we've got great earthly houses and we have, we have a missing pillar? I've got to be able to be in relation. Every, each and every, we, we, spouses, we need to look at each other. We need, hey, hey, how, how, how are you doing with your relationship with God? Because coming back and forth to church year after year, death, and there's something wrong. I need that pillar in my home or it's going to fall. I need, I, I need that pillar of uninhibited relationship with you. There needs to be something about us. And, and, and if maybe someone, Sister Crow said something to me in the middle of service and it just happened. I apologize for bringing this up. She made a statement. She got notified about something. I said, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now in Jesus' name because she, the stuff that's going on, it just was scary crazy. And like, Jesus needs to intervene. What, what am I doing? There's an uninhibited relationship. God, I'm in relationship. Someone over here needs you. When we take that mentality and we have that attitude that I'm going to have a relationship with God, not so I could be saved, but so I could be a free-flowing channel and a house that stays built important to Jesus Christ. Psalms 24, it's an amazing psalm, and it displays the wonder and the majesty of God. And we're reminded just how great God is, and in the light of that, kind of how small we are. Look, 
just to help you out, it's easy to look like something important here on this planet. They're, they're celebrating people who don't even know what gender they are today. So be, be careful if you think you're a big shot today. Mm -hmm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell, that dwell therein. Everything he made is his and it exists for his glory. From the towering superstitious mountains to the crashing waves of the ocean to the drifting sand dunes of the desert and the towering redwoods of the forest. Every tree, every raindrop, every creature, every high hill, every lush valley exists to give him praise. Revelations 4 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. He made it all. It's all his. That's how great he is. That's how mighty he is. That's how powerful he is. That's how detailed he is. That's how meticulous he is. That's how holy he is. Listen to me. Who's the greatest around here? No, which one of you is the greatest in here? Which, who thinks they're the greatest in here? Raise your hand. I can tell you who. The Bible tells us who. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Oh, God, let me get that uninhibited pillar of relationship. Oh, let me be a Hey, what are you doing around here? What you involved in around? Get that pillar built back in your life. Are you, are you, are, listen, 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 listen. Are, are you, are you ready? We are never told to be great because he is. We are never told to be mighty because he is. Oh, hallelujah. But we are most certainly commanded to be. Are you hearing me? We are commanded to be. How many knows about the Beatitudes? That's what you got to be. See, see, some of us are in that kindergarten relationship of doing what you need to be. It's what you are. I, I'm a servant. I have an uninhibited relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's nothing beneath me or beyond me to do. First Peter tells us, but as he which hath called you is holy. Listen. So be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Note that our commandment toward a holy lifestyle is based on the understanding of who he is. So on the heels of the declaration that all the earth is the Lord's, we are asked an important question. Psalms 24 and 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Do I have any takers tonight? What a question. Can you grasp tonight the magnitude of what is being asked here? A human, a person with flaws, issues, problems, even being given the chance to ascend up into the hill of the Lord. You see, you have to understand and read this through the lens of a Jewish mind that they remembered the day when God came down on the top of Mount Sinai. It was a glorious, amazing event. Trumpets sounded. The mountain trembled. Smoke descended. Thick darkness settled there. Lightning flashed. The voice of God thundered. Moses got to see it. He could have the moment when he asked God to show him his glory. But the rest of Israel was told to stay back. Some elders came part the way up. Joshua went a little higher. But the millions down below were commanded to stay back and told that if they even touched the mountain, they would die. 
But here the psalmist is saying, who would like to come up into the hill of the Lord? Who would like to stand in the holy place? Israel couldn't imagine the holy place. I mean, the holy place to walk into the tabernacle, to pass into that area where only the priests could go to view the glory of God, to see the showbread, to smell the incense, to witness the glimmering light of the candlestick. What, what, what would possibly qualify a man to step into the glory of God? And yet, that invitation stands true today. Who would like to step into daily glory? Who here tonight would like to enter into the very presence of God? Who here tonight would like to bring all your challenges, all your questions, and all your fears, and walk with boldness? into the throne room of God, to ascend into his hill, to stand in his holy place. Here is the responsibility we have. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. If I can enjoy the rich blessing of attaining to these two commandments, oh God, I'm glad to do so. Clean hands and a pure heart. This is not an isolated commandment. We find it echoed in the New Testament as well. James 4, 8, Dry not, draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God. Draw close to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We have an invitation today. You've been granted access to an unhibited relationship. Purify your heart. Cleanse your hands. God set before you an open door. Let those words sinners and double-minded convince us that it is not directed to us. Let us realize that James, like all the epistles, is written, written to save people. But why, is this, why, why, why does it say that? Because we can let sin in our spirits. None of us intends to be double-minded or double-tongued, but anybody acts, find yourself there. He writes to us, and he tells us to draw near to him. It requires clean hands and a pure heart. It's interesting to me, interesting to me that clean hands speaks of purity in the outward, visible manners. And the pure heart speaks of purity where no one can see that inner purity of thought and mindset. Paul gives us the same, presents us the same theme in, in, in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Can I put it this way, church? It's all in how you walk into the house of God or how you attend. It's, we, we must be people who are so desperate for close communion with him that we are perpetually seeking to purify ourselves inward and outward. I, I can have long sleeves, but do I have long suffering? I could, have, I, I, I could have been baptized into the church 38 years ago, but am I still walking close with him today? I may have spoken in tongues that day, but can I speak in tongues today? This topic of holiness is a strange one because as soon as it is approached, I know what happens. People get defensive and start bowing up. See, because you have your candy stick on what you think holiness is. It happens, especially when you've been doing it a long time. Why? Do we not understand this verse, Hebrews 12, 14? Follow peace with all men and holiness, 
without which no man shall see the Lord? It's not a trick question. Who wants to be close to God? How many want communion? Relationship with God, not just to know him or know about him, but how many want to walk with him? We declare, I want to see him. I want to hear him. I want to know what he's doing. Right? So then, I want to be holy. Notice, it. oh, I have to be holy. No. Oh, no, I, I, it's like saying, oh, I have to be married. Let's be honest, some of us, it's subtle, but it's enough to bring a blockage in your relationship with God. You have a relationship, but do you have a close relationship? I want to be holy. I want to be holy in how I dress. I want to be holy in my appearance. I want to be holy in my speech. I want to be holy in my conduct. I want to be holy in my thoughts. Ooh, I, I want to be holy in my intentions. I, I want to be holy in my spirit, in my attitude. Let me tell you something. I've been living for God for 38 years. I'm still working on a lot of these things. I still have to bring every thought into subjection. Everything in my life that you can see and everything in my life that only he can see. God, help me tonight to be holy that I could build a pillar of and have a habitual relationship. Uninhibited. Well, we know that, and I talked about this the other night. We all know God told Samuel that man looks on the heart or the outward appearance, but, but God looks on the heart. It's absolutely true. That's why if we all dress up on the outside without true purity of God inwardly, we're called, we're called a Pharisee in the Bible. Oh, you, oh, great, you got long sleeves, but you're sitting around critical? You're a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee if I sit around. Listen, let me, tell, let me help you with something. I don't get up here wanting to preach to all the problems. I believe in the tares and we. I got some people want me to rip some of you right on out. Oh, no, 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 no. We're all at a different place. It, cra it cracks me up. I've been living for God a long time, but I understand being around the church a long time, getting those hangups. Oh, God, I wish they'd get this. I wish they'd get that. My God, when's the last time I taught a Bible study? When's the last time I prayed for someone? When's the last time someone sat around my dinner table and partake of the blessings that God gave me that I might reach them for God? God, give a rip about your long sleeves and your hair if you can't love someone enough to invite them into your home and love them despite what they look like. They're on the inside looking for God and they're outside. They don't even understand yet. Yeah, some of us deliver God so long. We got the outside right and our inside's all jacked up. Um, I, what are you talking about? I'm talking about what I deal with. Some of you ain't, ain't brave enough to say that. Because the Lord compared that mentality to whited sepulchers, which is nice and white on the outside, but full of dead carcasses within. Or a cup that's been washed on the outside. But it's got something stuck from the last drink inside it. Now, in my opinion, nothing gets me more upset when I reach into the cupboard and pull out a dirty dish. I don't get that upset because I'm just not doing dishes around my house. But it's like, what? Anybody else? Can I tell you something? The, the reverse isn't good either. <laughs> it can be clean on the inside so the outside doesn't matter. Are you out of your mind? If that spaghetti noodle sticking around the outside lip of that thing, I still ain't using it. Are you hearing with? Are you hearing me? I pick out a plate and there's something stuck on the bottom. I'm still not putting something on. Ah! No one is going to tell me how to look. No one's going to tell me about my hair. It's my own. I, are you hearing what I'm saying? 
we err just as badly if, if, we, if we think the reverse is true. It's inside or outside. Hey, we need to be progressing in God. No one's going to tell me this. No, fine. God is looking at my heart. But are my insides clean? Don't you hear that? It doesn't matter how all this is. God sees my heart. Correct. But both matter. Dress how you want to be addressed. Because all of it speaks of the heart. Mm -hmm. And if you want to turn around, oh, God, it's funny those people that God care about, oh, God only sees my heart, but they don't want to be a part of a church. But yet he's coming for the church. You see the deception there? In order to maintain this intimate communion, this uninhibited relationship, we have to have clean hands and a clean heart, both. Sanctification is being set apart, set apart to God, and set apart from sin. Does that make sense? It's not either one without the other. If we, if we attempt to be set apart from sin without being set apart to God, we are a Pharisee who has confused self-righteousness regulations with relationship. If your relationship is just in your uniform, it's easy to take the uniform off and walk away. People walk away all the time, but what's in the heart? Because that's what keeps a relationship together. Right, Mary, folks? Hmm. Holiness is God's invitation to each and every one of us to be in communion with him. It's not a list of to-dos and don'ts that I have to check off to get to heaven. It's not a checklist of things that I got to meet his approval with because that's impossible. He's infinitely holy, and I could never measure up. Let me tell you something. If you think you measure up by your holiness standards, you're in trouble. So when God gives me instructions for life and lifestyle, he has given me the recipe to a close relationship with him. When he told Adam, don't eat the tree of the garden, he wasn't being dictatorial. He was being merciful. He's saying, if you'll just exercise this one discipline, I'll come down and walk with you in the garden every day. When God gives us guidance regarding these marks of devotion in our lives, he's not demonstrating that he is in charge. He's saying, if you will consecrate these certain areas to me, we will enjoy a close fellowship and communion together. Now, don't confuse this as too much or demanding. I'm going to be bringing this to a close. I know it's late. Who likes to eat out? We all do. I've been around here. I, uh huh. Is asking for a clean plate at a restaurant too much? Is asking for a clean cup a bit judgmental of the restaurant? How about fresh food that won't make you sick or give you food poisoning? Should we just be happy we got something to eat? How about it tasting good? Are we being judgmental when we go out to eat and we want just a certain level of cleanliness, edibleness, I don't know about you, but I'll be the first one to tell you I don't eat where it's not clean. In fact, some of you have been around me. We walked into a restaurant, and I said, nope, and I'm walking out just because of a certain smell. Anybody? Some of you have been with me when I've done that. It's okay to have standards where you won't pollute yourself. God is, hates sin. You're just not going to walk in and out. and Uh-uh. Stop, listen, listen, when you start having standards, the first thing you start hearing is people, outsiders or people who don't want to close with God. Ah, you don't have 
to do that. That's too much. Hey, listen, those folks don't care about you or the relationship. See, 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 there's so much adultery in the world today. No one minds committing spiritual adultery either. Who wants a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? Then there's no price too high to pay to have that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want that pillar of uninhibited communion with God. Let's all stand. If you will lay this over and apply this to your relationship with one another, you'll have a vibrant, passionate relationship full of forgiveness and fun. Are you hearing me? What does God want today? When, when, when David was seeking to get back, because David had lost out, but he was seeking it back to that place of fellowship with God, he made some observations I'm going to share with you real quick. How many know Psalms 51 is David's repentance? It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter to, 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 to examine yourself with. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness according unto the multiple, a multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. See, the Bible says, those people who say they, say they have no sin or haven't sinned, the Bible talks about that. All have sinned and come short of the glory. There, in, in essence, there's not one person here that wouldn't do well to be the first one at this altar tonight. For those that want an uninhibited relationship, especially if you haven't had one in a long time, well, I encourage you to be first. If, they were, if you were broke tonight and I had a million dollar check and I said the first one here, if you were broke tonight, I said, you know, probably do good to be first. Why does that make sense to some of you? But this don't. I'll tell you why. The world's had a bigger effect on you than wanting a relationship with God. David goes on, For I acknowledge my transgressions. See, it's not just you've done a sin or maybe you have been just okay with being distant with God. Ooh. My sin is ever before me. Let's not sweep anything under the rug tonight. If you haven't spoken in tongues or been in an altar or have, have gone to that place, of, I, I, don't, I wouldn't let another day go by. I, I, I don't know. You, you don't know. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou that mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. You see, you'll never produce a list of good deeds long enough to earn unending fellowship with a holy God. But he did say this, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Oh God. Let God be true, and I'm, home. I'm a liar. I need you. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. To those who are listening, every head bowed, eyes closed. To those listening right now, to those honest right now, to those wanting that uninhibited relationship with God, right now, there is a call to holiness of spirit and flesh. Not just outward, but inward. So if my spiritual house tonight is going to stand, I must build into it a pillar of uninterrupted communion between God and me.